Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Raz and in this video, we will discuss about interstate succession. So if you're ready, let's start. videos we have discussed already the basic concept of succession and testamentary succession and as we know there are three types of succession we have testamentary succession intestate succession and mixed succession as sort of recap when we say testamentary succession this is a succession which is made through a will but if the decedent the deceased person died without a will or last will and testament then the operation of the law would come in to settle the remaining estate of the decedent so in this video we will discuss about intestate succession so intestate succession it is a legal succession because it takes effect through the operation of the law because there is no will left behind by the dissident it is a transmission of properties where there is no will or if there is a will such will is void or lost its validity or nobody succeeds the will hence there must be another way or process or means to divide or to settle the properties or estate left behind in the intestate succession the entire estate of the dissident is distributed to the heirs so in our discussion about testamentary succession uh the estate is divided into two parts we have the legitim and the free portion when we say legitim this is the part of the estate or inheritance which is reserved or restricted exclusively for the distribution to, to the compulsory heirs such as the children or their descendants, the spouse, the illegitimate child or children, the parents. So those are the compulsory heirs and these compulsory heirs will share from the legitimate portion of the estate However, aside from the legitim, we also have the free portion, which is the remaining balance after deducting the legitim portion of the estate. And this free portion could be freely disposed by the dissident himself to anyone he wants to. So that was under testamentary succession. However, in the intestate succession, there is no such thing as legitim or free portion. Because since there is no will, therefore the entire estate, the entire inheritance is distributed solely to the heirs, okay? However, there are some common or similarities in the process of distributing shares to the heirs under the testamentary succession in the intestate succession. Like for example, in the testamentary succession, the legitimate child or children will first um, be called to inherit or to succeed the estate or the properties. And the same is true under intestate succession. And also, in the testamentary succession, we have mentioned that when there is a child, a legitimate child, the parents of, of the dissident will no longer claim or to be excluded from the distribution of inheritance so the same is true under intestate succession also as regards to the sharing between the legitimate child and the illegitimate child still the same is true because the legitimate children will have a higher will have a double a share compared to the illegitimate child under intestate succession so those are just some of the uh, similarities between testamentary and intestate succession so later on we will show you i will show you how or what are the differences between intestate succession and testamentary succession okay so the compulsory heirs in the testamentary succession are also the heirs in the intestate succession so as we know, we have compulsory heirs in the testamentary succession and they are classified into primary and secondary. 
as we have mentioned, the primary compulsory heirs will be the first people to be called upon to succeed the inheritance. And in their absence, the secondary compulsory heirs will come in, will step in to claim their right to the, to the inheritance. Okay, however, again, the presence of the legitimate child or children in their descendants would exclude the secondary compulsory heirs. Okay, however, intestate heirs also include brothers and sisters, collateral relatives within the fifth degree of consanguinity in the state. Okay, and then in intestate succession, the administrator or administratrix is the person appointed by the court in the accordance with the governing statute to administer and settle intestate estate and such testate estate as no competent executor designated by the testator. In the testamentary succession, the person who will settle, who will execute the will is called the executor or the executrix if she's a girl or a woman rather. And then, under interstate succession, the person who is going to administer the governing statute will be called the administrator or administratrix. Okay? So, here are some guiding rules when uh, distributing estate under interstate succession. Number one, the nearer excludes the farther. So, as I have mentioned, the ch the legitimate children and their descendants will be the first people to be called upon to succeed but when the children are present the grandchildren cannot inherit okay for example if a is the father who is the dissident and then b is the son and c is the grandson therefore the first person who will be called upon to succeed would be b the son but when b is already dead then c would come in to inherit the estate of A, okay? So, again, the nearer relative excludes the farther relatives, okay? Surviving spouse and illegitimate children are concurrent heirs with the legitimate descendants. Meaning, when we say concurrent heirs, meaning to say, even if the legitimate descendants are not present, or the legitimate children are absent and there are legitimate parents who would come in to to inherit the properties still a surviving spouse and illegitimate children could inherit because they are concurrent heirs with the legitimate descendants meaning they cannot be excluded so when the children are absent and the descendants are also absent and then the parents are present so together with the parents we have the surviving spouse and the illegitimate children if there is any so they will inherit together concurrently unlike in the case of the children and the parents because when the children are present the parents cannot inherit when the children are present the spouse the illegitimate children can also concurrently inherit Another rule is that the right of representation takes place in direct descending line, but never in the ascending line. So, for example, A is the father, and then there are two children. For example, we have B and C. Both B and C can inherit with their father's inheritance, okay? But when B is already dead he can be represented by his son or by his child who is also a grandchild of a okay so the grandchild can represent his father in his father's right to claim the estate to his grandfather okay you get my point so for example if B and C are the children, and then D is the grandchild of A to B. Therefore, when B is already dead, ahead of A, his father, the grandchild could step in, could represent 
his father's right to claim to the estate of A. Okay. However, in the case of ascending line, for example, uh, when the dissident is single, unmarried, no child, so normally the people who will be called upon will be the parents, right? So, for example, A is the son or A is the child who is also our dissident and then B and C are the parents of A. So, B and C would normally be called be the first persons to be called upon to inherit the inheritance or the estate of A, their child. However, when one of the parents is already dead, the other child of B and C, meaning the siblings of A, could not represent their parents. Okay, because that would be a conflict, right? Because the person who died is the, a child of B and C. And if one of B and C is already dead before A, neither can be represented. Meaning, if A has other siblings, no other siblings could represent their parents on behalf of their parents' right to claim to the estate of their sibling who died. Right? Next, a renouncer may represent but may not be represented. A renouncer is someone who renounced or waived his right to claim to the estate. For example, if A is the father and then B and C and D are the children, okay, so they will be the first to succeed. So if one of the three children waived or renounced his right, to claim to the estate of A. For example, if B renounced his right to claim to the estate of um, A, he can do so in favor of C and D, of his siblings. Okay? If between C and D, one is already dead, for example, C is already dead, and then B renounced his right. Okay? So, B may represent C to claim C's right, okay? Even if, or despite the fact that B renounced his right in favor of the two. However, no other person could represent B on his right to claim to the estate of A, of their father, because he has already waived or renounced his right and he cannot be represented for that. Or no other person could reclaim again his right next we have an adopted child cannot represent neither may he be represented normally because he is not blood related to the parent okay next we have in the collateral line the right of representation takes place only in favor of the children of brothers or sisters whether they be full or half blood for example uh, a is a dissident and then there are no parents, no other children, and the only surviving relatives are the sisters or brothers of the dissident. Okay, so for example, uh, there are four of them siblings, so A, B, C, and D. For example, our dissident is A, so no other relatives again, so B, C, and D, the siblings, could claim their right to the estate of A. They can be the heirs of A's estate because no other relatives. In case if B, the other sibling, is already dead, okay, so we have now C and D only, okay? But when B has children, okay, who are still alive, the children of B can represent B's right to claim to the estate of A, who is their uncle or aunt, okay? B's children can represent him, can represent B, as pertaining to only B's right to the estate of A. Supposedly, the three siblings will have one-third, one-third share. That means to say, as a whole, in total, the children of B can only claim one-third 
portion of the estate of A, okay? Not as if they are siblings, okay? They're just nephews or nieces of A. So they will just represent on behalf of their father who is B or their mother who is B, okay? So they will only represent the right of B as a whole. Full blood brothers and sisters share twice or double than that of half blood brothers and sisters. And should there be more than one ascendant of equal degree belonging to the same line, they will divide the inheritance per capita. So for example, if the deceased person is a child who is unmarried, who has no children, so the parents will inherit, right? And if both of the parents are still alive, they will share the estate of their child who died per capita. It means per person. So since there are only two of them as parents, so the estate will be divided by two, okay, per capita. And should they be of different lines but of equal degree, one half shall go to the paternal while the other half to the maternal ascendants. Okay, so as to what I have just said, that's per capita. So here is the table of the intestate distribution. It is said that when there is or when there are only legitimate children or their descendants alone, no spouse, no other successor, the entire estate is to be shared equally by them. And when there are legitimate children at the same time parents, our priority is the children. So 100% of the estate will go to the children. The parents will receive nothing. And if there are legitimate children and the brothers or sisters of the dissident, again, 100% to the children. When there are legitimate children and surviving spouse, the spouse will get the share of one legitimate child because they are concurrent heirs, okay? In contrast to this, to the, to the second rule in which the legitimate children excludes the parents. The parents will only come in when the legitimate children are absent. When there are legitimate children and illegitimate children, the illegitimate children will get only one half of the share of one child. And when there are legitimate children, illegitimate children, and the spouse, again, the children will get double share, and then the illegitimate children will only get one half share of one legitimate ch child and then the spouse will get one share of one legitimate child when there are legitimate children alone no other children no spouse no parents the entire estate will be shared by them and when there are leg illegitimate children and legal parents they will share one half one half and when there are Legitimate children and surviving spouse, they will share one half and one half, same as the other one. And when there are illegitimate children, legal parents, and serving spouse, the legal parents will get one half while the other two will get one fourth. When there are legal parents and surviving spouse, they will share equally one half and one half. Same with illegitimate parents and surviving spouse. And when there are Parents and brothers and sisters, again, 100% to parents because brothers and sisters are not part of the compulsory heir. They are voluntary heirs. And when there are adopted children and legitimate children, they will share the estate equally. Why? Because adopted children are also legitimate children, okay? Despite the fact that they are not blood-related, but since... Adopted children are legally adopted children, so they will share in the same way as the legitimate children. When the dissident is an adopted child with no descendants, has no descendants, the parents by blood and relatives by blood will inherit the entire asset. And when the surviving relative is beyond the fifth degree of consanguinity, the state will inherit. So we will discuss fifth degree of consanguinity or degree of consanguinity later on in this video. So let's have an illustration. Juan de la Cruz died in the state living a net hereditary estate of 50 million to his 
children compute the inheritance of each compulsory heir. So Juan de la Cruz has no will. Therefore, intestate succession. So since intestate succession uh, will apply in this case, the entire estate will be shared by the children equally. And there will be no legitimate or free portion because this is not a testamentary succession. Therefore, all four will share the estate equally by 12 million 500 pesos each no free portion under intestate succession so we have second example juan de la cruz died intestate living in net territory estate of 50 million to his four legitimate children and two illegitimate children so we are also going to compute the inheritance of each compulsory heir so always remember the legitimate children will share twice as the illegitimate children or child. To compute this, we will first to uh, compute how many units, okay? So, the estate will be divided as follows. So, the share of the legitimate children, there are four of them, will be twice. So, that is times two. So, four times, eight, uh, times two, that's eight. And the share of the illegitimate children will be one. And there are two illegitimate children, so therefore 2 times 1. Again, the legitimate child will get twice the share of 1 illegitimate children. And that is a total of 10. So therefore, we will divide the 50 million by 10. Okay? So therefore, each legitimate child, there are 4 of them, will receive 10 million that is 2 times 5 million okay so again each legitimate child will get twice the share of one illegitimate child so 2 times 5 million that is 10 million so each of the four legitimate children will get 10 million while each illegitimate child will receive 5 million let's have another illustration Juan de la Cruz died in this state living in net hereditary estate of 50 million to his four legitimate children, three illegitimate children, and his spouse. So again, we are going to compute the inheritance of each compulsory heir. So since this is an intestate succession, we will not have illegitimate. So again, we will use the units. So the share of the legitimate children, there are four of them, times two because they will share twice or double the share of one illegitimate child. So that is eight. And the share of the spouse is equivalent to one child. So if each child will share two units, therefore the share of the spouse will also be two. Okay? Because equal. And then the share of the illegitimate children will be one unit and there are three of them so three times one so a total of 13 okay so we will divide the 50 million by 13 so that is three million eight hundred forty six thousand one hundred fifty three pesos and eighty five centavos so therefore each legitimate child there are four of them will share 7,692,307.69 centavos. You just multiply the 3.8 here by 2 because, again, double yung share ni legitimate child. And then the spouse will also receive the same or equal to the share of one legitimate child. While the illegitimate child, each of the three illegitimate child, will receive 3.8 million. Okay, that's it. Another illustration. Juan de la Cruz died in this state, leaving a net military estate of 50 million to his three legitimate children, one illegitimate child, his spouse, and parents. So compute the inheritance of each compulsory heir. Okay, hold on. As I have said, when the legitimate children are present, the parents are excluded from succession okay 
So therefore, we will use, we will have the same computation. So the share of the legitimate child or children will be 3 times 2, that is 6, because there are 3 of them, and then the spouse equivalent to 1 child, and then 1 illegitimate child, uh, that's child, okay? I'm sorry. So that is 1. So total units, we have 9, so therefore we will divide the 50 million by 9. So that is 5,555,000 555 pesos point 56 centavos. So each legitimate child will get 11 million 111 thousand and 111 point 11. The same with the share of the spouse while the illegitimate child will get only half of the share of one legitimate child. Okay? Very easy. So, the parents will receive nothing because the children are present. We have here. Juan de la Cruz died in the state living in net hereditary estate of 50 million. The only surviving relatives of Juan are Pedro, his second cousin, and Maria, his great grandniece. So compute inheritance of each compulsory heir. Okay, Juan de la Cruz died without children, without parents, without spouse, and also without siblings. And the only people surviving him are Juan, I mean, are Pedro and Maria. So are Pedro and Maria relatives to Juan? within the fifth degree of consanguinity because if neither of them or if both of them are beyond fifth degree of consanguinity, therefore, Juan's estate will go to the state or the government. Okay, so let us now introduce the degree of consanguinity. So look at here. This is the table, the table of consanguinity. So assuming this is Juan the person who died okay the persons below one are called the descending lines okay descending lines has no limit no limit even if beyond fifth degree and when i say degree this is the line going down or going up so when we say great grandchildren this is third degree from Juan, the person that is one degree to the children, two degrees to the grandchildren, and three degrees to the great grandchildren. So the great grandchildren are within third degree. But always remember in the descending or ascending lines, the fifth degree does not apply. Okay, so even if the line is going 7th or 8th or ninth or 10th degree, so still they are relatives. So if Juan is the person who died and the only surviving relative is his great, 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 great grandchildren, still that person could inherit from Juan because in descending or ascending lines, we will not apply the fifth degree of consanguinity. The fifth degree of consanguinity applies only to the collateral lines, meaning to the lines which is not within the descending lines or the ascending lines. Okay? So, for example, in our uh, problem, the surviving relatives are two. We have Pedro and Maria. Pedro is a second cousin and Maria is a great grand niece of Juan. So we will count whether how many degrees is, is there from Juan to Maria and from Juan to Pedro. So this is Juan again. So we'll go up to the parents. So Juan to his parents is one degree. Parents of Juan to his brothers or sisters is another degree. So what it is, um, one, two, okay? 
and then from his brothers or sisters to his nephews or nieces is another degree. So one, two, three. Okay, so this is third degree of one. So when we say nephews or nieces, third degree of consanguinity. From the nephews and nieces down, we will have another degree down. So the great nephews or nieces is fourth degree. And another line going down to great grand nephews or nieces is also another degree. So this is the fifth degree of consanguinity. And then as we have said, Maria is a great grandniece of Juan. Therefore, if this is Maria, okay, in your screen, if this is Maria, therefore from Juan, one, two, three, four, five. So Maria is a relative of Juan within fifth degree of consanguinity. Therefore, Maria can inherit from Juan. Okay, now let's have the second cousin. So the second cousin is here. Okay. So I know you have seen the sixth, meaning Pedro is with it, is beyond fifth degree, but let us count. Okay. We will trace where the root of Pedro and Juan comes. Okay. So from from Juan to his parents, that is one degree. From his parents to his grandparents, that's another degree, so that's second degree. From his grandparents to great-grandparents, that is third degree. From his great-grandparents down to his great-uncles or aunts, so that's fourth degree. From the first cousins removed, that is fifth degree, okay? And then we have the sixth, the second cousin, which is, who is Pedro? So that is sixth degree. So Pedro is beyond the fifth degree of consanguinity. Therefore, in our problem, only Maria can inherit the entire estate of Juan. Okay? So that's it. That's how you uh, determine the degree of consanguinity. Always go back, go up, then down, okay? If the, if the only surviving relative is the third cousin, go up to where your root is common. So for example, if this is the person who died, the person in the surviving relative is the third cousin, therefore, the person should go to fourth degree first before reaching the third cousin because this great grand great great grandparents is um the common to the person in the third cousin okay so these people are the collateral lines okay so as a sort of recap for descending lines there is no such thing as degree of consanguinity even though that they are beyond fifth degree as long as they are in the descending line still they can inherit same goes with the ascending lines but for the collateral lines only fifth degree of consanguinity okay thank you so much for watching and i hope you learn a lot from this video if you're new to this channel please subscribe click the bell so you'll be notified whenever i will upload new videos thank you so much for watching bye